Hello, and it's been a long time since I've done any of this, but I thought it was time for a part two to the pathfinding video series. Uh, we originally did the A star algorithm, and you can look at that video by clicking on the link in the top right. But this time, we're going to look at a slightly different algorithm, perhaps simpler than A star in certain situations, or, but also maybe less useful too. Uh, I think it's quite a debatable one. We're going to look at wave propagation. And this is what I'm going to be developing in this video. And if it looks eerily familiar, then, well, yes, it should, because you've probably seen in the programming A star video. In fact, it looks exactly the same. We have a starting point marked in green, uh, which we can move around, and we have an ending point marked in red, which uh, I can't move around in this particular video. We can see an array of nodes, which are blue for empty space and grey for solid obstacles. And just like with the A star video, if you start placing obstacles, it finds different paths. So in this case, it's trying to find the shortest path, and it has done, and I've marked it with uh, yellow circles this time to make the path a little bit more visible. You'll also see that I've assumed eight-way connectivity, so things can move in diagonals. We'll see in this video that that doesn't have to be the case. We can also use four-way connectivity. And just with a star, if there is no path, you can see I've just blocked it off here, then there is no path. There's no solution that can be found. I'll try and make it go a long way round. And we see the performance is actually quite fine. On here, it's running about at 900 frames per second. Now, this is a very small area it has to path over. But that's one of the nice things about the wave propagation approach to pathfinding, is it's relatively computationally simple. Now, just before I get too stuck into explaining the algorithm, uh, you'll notice also that this seems to be quite a high resolution, and that's because I'm doing it in the pixel game engine instead of the console game engine. And I wanted the high resolution uh, to demonstrate an effect later on. And for the first time ever in a One Lone Code video, I'm going to make a little personal announcement. I've had a surprising number of requests that people would in some way like to support me. Uh, as a result, I've created a Patreon page. You can find the link to the Patreon below, and what I will say is it is entirely up to you, there is no obligation at all, um, I probably won't be producing any exclusive content, and it is unlikely that I'll even mention your names in any videos. But if you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, then pop on over to the Patreon page. When I looked at the A star algorithm, one of the fundamental assumptions we made was that the locations, the waypoints, didn't necessarily have to be organised in any particular way. We just had a graph of interconnected nodes. And so the algorithm was really tasked with trying to find the shortest path from one node to the other, knowing some sort of heuristic and the distance between the nodes. The A star algorithm itself was computationally quite simple, but conceptually it was a little tricky. And as part of that demonstration, I made another fundamental assumption. Even though we could use A star on generic graphs like that, in fact, what we did was have routinely positioned nodes in a grid. And we applied the A star algorithm to nodes with different types of connectivity. So in this case, we've got four-way connectivity between all of the nodes. And this was quite convenient and used in many real-time strategy games and path planning applications for robots. It's quite nice to represent your world as an array such as this. But this begs the question, if we've got routine structure like this, do we need most of the A star facilities in order to find the shortest path? And the answer is no. For a long time, there's been an alternative algorithm based upon wave propagation. And I'm quite sure all of you will have used wave propagation, and some of you may not know that you've used it. If you've ever used the flood fill tool in Paint, or in Photoshop, or GIMP, then you've used a form of wave propagation. Fundamentally, what we're trying to achieve is the transmission of information from a starting point across the array. And this wave front carries the information. The contents of the array itself can change what happens to that wave front. So let's assume we've got an area of solid on our map and we cast out the same wave. Just like a sound wave, it propagates around the corner. This is a very useful dynamic of wave propagation. OK, so pathfinding by wave propagation is a little bit different, and I'm going to hand walk through an example here. I'll start off with uh, quite a bit of detail, but as we get the hang of it, I'll probably speed it up a little bit. 
The advantage to doing wave propagation is it works very nicely on 2D grids. And we can see here I've got a 2D array of, uh, well, effectively booleans. Either an obstacle exists, it's shaded grey, or it doesn't. And whereas you can implement wave propagation on nodes, it means more when you're operating on a grid. And so what I'm going to show is how we get uh, from a start location to an end location, which I've marked with the green and red dots. Red is the end, green is the start. Now, we can solve this problem very quickly by looking at it. We can see which series of cells do we need to pass through to get from one to the other. But of course, the computer doesn't have this top-down perspective. It needs to generate some method of pathing from one location to the other. And ideally, we want to try and find the shortest path. Now, I'm going to prime our 2D array uh, with some information already. So, if the cell contains an obstacle or a block, I'm going to fill it with the value minus 1. And for cells that represent empty space, I'm going to fill it with the value 0. The objective here is to fill the map with the distance away from the target location. And we'll do this by emitting the distance from the target location and watching it flood fill the map. The boundary of the flood fill is effectively our wave propagation. Now that I've set up the array with information to help us work out where the obstacles are, I'm also going to maintain a couple of lists, and these are lists of nodes. Now I'm going to use the word node or cell interchangeably here. Typically a node wouldn't really be uh, implied on a 2D matrix like this, but that's what I mean. Now to start the algorithm, I'm going to prime it with the target location. So in this list on the left, I'm going to put in the coordinates of where we want the path to stop. So that's 5 in the x-axis, 1 in the y-axis, and I'm going to set another value called d to 1, and d is going to represent the distance. And so here we go. I'll step through the algorithm quite verbosely to start with. We take the first entry in our list of discovered nodes, and we look at the d value, and we write the d value to that location. So 5, 1 is here. It's where we end the path. So we'll change that 0 to a 1. That's the first step. The next step is to look at our immediate neighbours and see if the value they contain is non-zero. If it is non-zero, we're not interested. So, let's have a look. We'll take the northern neighbour first, up here. We can see its value is minus 1. I'm not interested in that node. We'll look at the eastern neighbour here. Well, that's minus 1 also. That's not 0. Now we'll look at the southern neighbour. And we can see the value is 0, and so this means we want to do something. We have discovered a new node. Nothing has touched this node before, but it's a valid node that we're interested in. So I'm going to add the coordinates of this new node to my second list here. So this is a 5 uh, in the x, uh, 2 in the y, and to calculate the d value, we take our current d value, which is 1, and add 1 to it. So d in this instance becomes 2. And I'll draw a square around it to say that that's a newly discovered node. The final neighbour left to check is our western neighbour. And indeed, again, the value is 0. So that means we've discovered a node that's not been discovered before. So we'll add that to our list as well. In this case, it's 4, 1 and 2 again, because we take the value of our current node, add 1 to it, and store that as the distance in our newly discovered node list. So for our first node here, which is the end location for the path, we've now finished the algorithm. Let's move on to step two. Step two is quite simple. We look at our list of newly discovered nodes, and we remove any duplicates. Well, we haven't got any duplicates here, and so what I'm going to do is remove the node that we have now processed, copy over our newly discovered nodes, and clear the newly discovered node list. So let's continue with the algorithm. We're now up to here. So the first thing we're going to do is find this node. This is 5 and 2, so that's this node here. And first stage is to take the d value and write it into the cell. So we'll replace the 0 here with a 2. We then start checking our neighbours. So we'll look at our northern neighbour. Well, that's non-zero, that's a 1. So that neighbour has been seen before, it's not new, so we're not interested in it. Let's look towards our eastern neighbour. Well, that's a minus 1, that's non-zero, not interesting. Look towards our southern neighbour. Well, that is a 0, we are interested in that one. So I'm going to add that to our newly discovered node list. In this case, it's location 5 by 3. And we take our current d value, which in this case is 2, 
We add one to it and store that as the new D value. Now all we've got left is our western neighbour, which again is zero, it's a cell we've not discovered. I'll just draw in the newly discovered cells. And we'll add that one also to our list. In this case it's four, two, and again three, because we take our current D value and add one to it. We've now completed uh, this node, so we can smoosh it out, there we go, and we look at the next node that's in our list, 412, which is here. So the first thing we want to do is take our D value and write that into the location of the cell. So we'll get rid of that 0 and put a 2. And now we check our neighbours. Well, north is minus 1, no good. East is 1, well that's not a 0 either. South. Now, we have discovered this node before, but as far as we're concerned, it's still a zero at this point in time. So, I'm going to add that again to the list of newly discovered nodes. So this is a four and a two, and we calculate D in exactly the same way. It's our current D value plus one. Four, two, three. And we've only got one node left to check now, that's our western neighbour. Well, that's a minus one, that's not very interesting. And then we're done. So the next phase is to look at our newly created nodes and remove the duplicates. And we can see we did have a duplicate there, 4, 2 and 3. So we don't want that. Once we've got rid of the duplicates, we copy over the newly discovered nodes into our list of nodes to process. And we'll clear this list. Right, we're up to 533 now. So that's here. The first thing we want to do is write in our D value into this cell. And we check our northern neighbours, not 0. Eastern neighbour, not zero. Southern neighbour is zero. So I'll flag that as a newly discovered node, get its coordinate, five, four, take my D value and add one to it. So we're storing that as a four this time. And then finally, check my Western neighbour. Again, this one is zero. So it's a newly discovered node. I'm going to capture that. It's a four, three, four this time. And then we've run out of neighbours. We've done north, south, east and west. So we're done. Squidge that one out. We're now going to process node 423. So step one is to write in the D value. Replace the zero with our three. And now we check our neighbours. Well, to the north, I've got a non-zero. To the east, a non-zero. To the south, I have got a zero. So I'm going to add that to the list. It's uh, four, three, and four again. Oh, we've got a duplicate. Fair enough, we know we'll get rid of that in a minute. And finally, I've got my western neighbour, which is a newly discovered node, uh, which in this case is 3, 2, 4. I've got no neighbours left now, so I'm done processing that node. It's time to look for duplicates and copy them over and remove them. Well, I can see here I have got some duplicates, 4, 3 and 4. So I'm going to remove one of them and then copy over the new nodes, 5, 4 and 4, 4, 3 and 4, 3, 2, and 4. I'm going to run out of space at the bottom, but we'll worry about that in a minute. All right, one last time we should be able to do this really quick now, and then I'll finish it off by hand and speed up the footage. We take the first node in our list of nodes to be processed, 5, 4, 4, which is this node down here. We take our D value, and we're going to replace that value that's already in the cell with the D value. So that 0 becomes a 4. I now check my neighbours. To the north, I've got nothing. To the east, I've got nothing. To the south, I've got nothing. Nothing means non-zeros, oddly, in this context. And to the west, well, I've got a newly discovered cell. It is a zero, it's something that we've not seen before. So I'm going to capture that and capture its location. In this case, four and four. I take my current D value and add one to it for the new D value. So that's a five. And I move on to the next node, four, three, four. So the first thing we'll do is replace the zero with the node's new D value, which is a four. And we'll check our neighbours. Well, to the north it's a 3, that's non-zero. To the east it's a 3, that's non-zero. To the south, we've discovered it before, but it's still considered a 0 at this point in time. So we'll capture that node again. 4, 4, and 5. And to the west, well, that's non-zero, so we don't add anything either. Got our last node to process now. Smooch that one out. 3, 2, 4. Well, north, nothing. East, nothing. South, nothing. But west, new node. And before I capture the new, what did I quickly forget to do? We forgot to put in the new D value. There we go. So I've got a new node here at 2, 2, and it's my D value 4 plus 1 to give me a new D value of 5. And then we're done with that node. The final thing to do is to look at our list of newly discovered nodes, remove the duplicates, 
and continue to process the nodes. Now, I've run out of space, so I'm going to start with my list again up here, but I'm also not going to do the commentary through this one. At this point you'll see I've discovered quite a few new nodes, and I've got quite a lot of duplication. So I don't need this one, and I don't need this one, and I don't need this one. That's okay, it's quite common for this algorithm to discover nodes that have already been discovered on the same cycle. But just carry on regardless, it'll still work. We've finally come to the situation where we've only got one node left now, and it's this bottom node down here, 1, 4, with a value of 8. Well, carrying on with the procedure is just fine. We'll replace the value with the d value of the node, which in this case is an 8. We can't discover any new nodes now, so at this point our discovered nodes list is completely empty. The algorithm has completed. And now that we have filled the array up with numbers, we can see that the pattern is that we have propagated away from the target destination an increasing value. So as we see, the target destination was this 1, around that we've got 2, then we've got some 3s, then we've got 4s, and then we've got 5s. Um, but these numbers increase depending upon the geometry of the level. As we come through the opening here, we can see that the next step in any direction from this cell will increment the distance by 1. It goes from 6, 6, and 6. And it's due to this distribution of numbers that we can calculate the shortest path. So if I take our starting location up here, I can create a path as follows. Let's assume I can only move north, south, east and west. I look at my immediate neighbours, I look at the value of them, and I see which is the lowest. Well, in this case I've only got a choice of 6 and 6. Anything less than 0 doesn't count. So it doesn't matter which one I choose, but let's say for argument's sake I choose this one. I can start to assemble my path. Now I'm in this cell, I look at my immediate neighbours and see which is the lowest value. Well, my value is 6, I've got a neighbour which is 7, and I've got a neighbour which is 5. I can only really go one way. Now at the 5 location, look at my neighbours, I've got a 6, a 6, a 6, and a 4. Well, I want to go to the lowest number. And this is why it's called, sometimes, a potential field approach, because we're effectively moving downhill towards the finish line. And so the height of a cell, or its D number, can be considered its potential. In cell 4, I've got a choice of a 5 on the left or a 3 on the right. Well, I follow the lowest. In this cell marked 3 now, my neighbours are two fours and two twos. Well, I can choose randomly either of the twos. The path length is going to be the same each way, so I'll choose this one. And finally, I can choose between a 3 and a 1, and I've found the end of my path. So by flooding the map with information relating to the distance away from the target location, we can then easily, as if we dropped a ball bearing on the map, watch its path as it descends towards the target location. We needn't just assume that we have uh, immediate neighbour connectivity either. We've been looking at four-way connectivity. We could easily just have eight-way connectivity too, in which case we'd get some nice diagonals, but the result is the same and you'll see there was never a chance of this algorithm ever choosing this long path here. And so that completes the wave propagation part of the algorithm. Let's replicate this in code. I'm going to code this one up pretty quickly because we've already done something similar with the A star algorithm, except this time I'm doing it in the pixel game engine. And I'm going to start with a basic pixel game engine template, and I've created a class derived from the pixel game engine called Pathfinding Flow Fields, and I'm creating a game engine of 512 pixels wide by 480 pixels high, and each pixel in the game space is two pixels on your screen. So let's get some of the boilerplate out the way. I know I'm going to need a two-dimensional map. We'll have map width and map height variables. I want the map to look like a grid, so we know which cells we're selecting. So I'm going to have a cell size variable, 
and I'm going to have a thickness which represents the border between the cells. So if we specify a cell size of 32 and we have a border width of 2, the actual drawn cell size is 30 pixels. And I'm going to need my first array which is going to be a boolean array called B obstacle map. And this is going to be true for an obstacle exists and false for it doesn't. I'll populate these variables in the onUserCreate function. So I'm going to specify to have a border width of 4 and a cell size of 32. And I'm going to make the map width and height variables depend on how big the game engine screen has been created in the first place. And I'll also create my array. I've defined the array to be defaulted to false. In onUserUpdate, I want to draw the array including the obstacles. Now I'm going to also draw a few other things as well as the video progresses, but to start with I want to just clear the screen and then I'll create two nested for loops which iterate through all of the cells in our map. The default colour for a cell is going to be blue and for each cell location I'm going to call the fillRect function uh, with some scaling parameters to specify the top left, top right, width and height of the cell. And you can see I'm only going to draw the cell uh, to the cell size minus the border width. That gives us this black border. And the colour is going to be blue as we've just defined. So let's just take a quick look. Perfect. Now I'm willing to bet that in probably 95% of my videos we do the same thing. We do y times width plus x to convert a 2D coordinate into a 1D index for an array. Since we're working primarily with arrays and neighbouring cells of other cells in the arrays, I'm going to create a little convenience lambda utility function to do this for me. It's just going to be called p and we'll pass along the x and y and it just performs that calculation. It'll make the code a little bit more visibly tidy. This means I can test for things inside my obstacle map array quite simply. I just call the lambda function with x and y and use the return of that as the index into my obstacle map. If it's true, I'm going to set the colour to grey and we'll draw it differently. Now, mouse interaction is pretty critical for this application. So I'm going to capture the current mouse coordinates at the start of every update cycle. I'm going to scale the mouse coordinates into the same space as the grid that we've created. So it takes the screen coordinate x and y, divides it by the cell size, and it's an integer divide, so we get the actual cell that the cursor is hovering over. And if the user clicks the mouse button, uh, I'm going to respond to the released state of the get mouse uh, zero, which is the left mouse button. I'm going to toggle the state of that particular cell. Does it, is it an obstacle or isn't it? Using our newly found mouse coordinates, I'm going to use our lambda function to index into the obstacle map array and simply invert the state of that cell using the exclamation mark here. This will allow me to toggle the cells. Very nice. As part of the demonstration, I'm going to need a starting and ending location for our path. I'm just going to store these as integer coordinates. And in onUserCreate, I'll give them some default values. In onUserUpdate, I'm going to make it that if the user right-clicks somewhere within the array, it changes the start location. So the 1 here in the getMouse function corresponds to the right mouse button. I'm not going to put in a way to set the end location. We'll need to draw our start and end locations, but this is quite simple now just by quickly changing our loop to also include uh, if the loop coordinate is the same as our start coordinate, we'll set the colour to green, and if it's the same as the end coordinate, we'll set it to red. We don't have a path to draw yet, so that's the next step. Now just like I did with the A star video, it's very difficult to actually do this algorithm in stages. It kind of all needs to be there to work, so we will be looking at most of the code to begin with before running any visual tests. I'm going to add an additional map, and this time it's going to be an integer. I'll call it flow field Z, and you might be wondering why Z. Uh, this represents the D value that we've just seen when we calculated it by hand, and in many ways that D value can be considered the height of the map at that location. So uh, I'm going to create an array of heights. Naturally, this needs to be initialized, and we'll create the same uh, width and height as our obstacle map. Now I'm going to run the pathfinding every single frame, which is quite redundant because really you should only do the pathfinding when you need to do it, i.e. the path has changed in some way or other. But before we can do any pathing, we need to initialize our flow field Z array according to what obstacles are in the map. And so I'm going to do this by having again two nested for loops. And I want to set to minus one the corresponding location in our flow field map if we're on the border or there is an obstacle in that location. So the borders are fairly easy to check for. If x or y is equal to 0, 
then uh, it's going to be an obstacle. Likewise, if x or y is equal to the dimensions of the map minus 1, that's the other side. And finally, we'll dip into the obstacle map array itself, the array of booleans, at location x, y. If any of these return true, we're going to consider that location to be an obstacle. And so I'm going to set the flow field z for that location to minus 1. In all other situations, I'm going to set it to 0. Once the flow field has been prepared, we can now start the algorithm. And we're going to need a little bit of boilerplate to get this going. We've seen in the manual example that I'm going to maintain a couple of lists. Well, I'm going to go all modern C on you. For the first time ever, you're going to see me actually use std colon colon in my code. And so it seems only fitting that we'll modern C++ this application to death. I'm going to create a list of tuples. There we go. Uh, and we can see the list is here, and the list will contain a uh, type tuple. And the tuple itself is of type int int int, where the first integer is the x coordinate of the new node that we've added, the second integer is the y coordinate of the new node that we've added, and the third integer is the distance of the new node that we've added. Remember, we had the columns on the right hand screen, x, y, and d, those correspond to these three integers. And so this is going to be our list of discovered nodes. And if you remember, the first thing that we add to this list is the end location and set it to 1. We now need to repeatedly run the algorithm until there are no nodes left in this list. And each time we process a node in this list, we're going to develop some new nodes. Now I'm going to maintain these in a separate list of tuples of integers, exactly the same format as before. Now it's time to iterate through the nodes in our list and process them. So I'm going to use a little auto for loop to do that. Just so things can remain slightly readable for the video, uh, I'm going to actually extract x, y, and d uh, independently from the tuple. And you do that using the standard get function. And the first stage of the algorithm is to write the current d value to that location. So we can do that with a single line. We take our array, flow field z, we use our little lambda function to index into the array at that, that location, and we're writing the d value to it. Now we want to check each of our compass point neighbouring nodes or cells. And I'm going to start by checking the eastern neighbour. That is, of course, the one to the right. Uh, but I don't want to go out of bounds, so the first thing I'm going to check for is, is the current x location plus 1 uh, a valid location to be sampling from our array from? And the nice thing about if is it, it's guaranteed to execute these conditions in order, so if any of them fail, the if will fail straight away. So that means I can pair this up with an array check, and this will allow me to safely check this array uh, regardless of what the x and y coordinates are going to be. I'm not going to go out of bounds for this array. And what I'm checking for is, is my neighbour equal to zero? Because any non-zero we're not interested in. It's already been discovered, or it's an obstacle. And by checking for x plus 1, I'm checking for the one on the right-hand side of me, my eastern neighbour. So in this case, if this returns true, then I want to push this node back onto my new nodes list, which is currently empty. And I'm going to push it back with the correct location, x plus 1 and y, and if you remember, we take the current d and add 1 to it. In a very similar way, I can check the western neighbour, except this time I'm checking to see that the western neighbour is, of course, uh, equal to or more than 0. And it goes without saying that north and south neighbours are also very similar indeed. So this auto for loop has now gone through all of the nodes in our node list to be processed and created a whole bunch of new nodes. We may have duplicates in there, though. So we want to sort that out. Now, if you're really keen on performance, the easiest way is to avoid duplicates altogether. Simply check as you're pushing the node into the new node array that it doesn't already exist. However, I'm flexing my modern C++ muscles today. And so I'm going to use uh, some standard library utility functions to help me out. It's important that we do remove the uh, duplicate nodes or else the algorithm will never complete. So how will we remove duplicates? And it's a little trickier in this case, because it's not like our nodes are just represented by a single number. They're represented by three different things. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is sort the list of new nodes. And you might think, oh no, hang on, we've got to sort in here. But on the whole, the list of new nodes is going to be quite small. And I'm going to use the sort function that comes as part of the linked list implementation. Uh, and you can pass to that a lambda function as one of its arguments. So we'll, we'll work through this. Don't worry uh, if it looks a little bit overwhelming at first. Uh, so the two arguments that get passed into the sort function are basically uh, 
references to the tuples uh, that we've been using, the tuples that are stored in the list at that location. And you'll get two of them because what the sort function is asking you to do is to compare them. Uh, and if you return a true, it'll swap them. And if you return false, it doesn't do anything. So this is sort of the fundamental sorting bit of its internal sort algorithm. It is the condition upon which things are sorted. So we need to provide it with an implementation to do this. And I'm going to do this a slightly strange way. Fundamentally, my condition is quite simple. I'm just checking to see if something is less than something else. And that something is actually going to be the result of our p lambda function, which we started with at the beginning. And the arguments I'm going to pass to that are the x and y locations for that specific tuple that's come in. And the reason I'm doing this is that the tuple will have an x and y coordinate. Um, I can't compare those very readily, but what I can do is convert them into a unique 1D value and I can compare those 1D values with the less than operator. So I do that for both sides of that operator corresponding to both tuples. And you might think, well, what kind of nonsense sort is this? And the truth is, I don't really care what the order is once they've been sorted. What I care about is that they are stacked up uh, in this particular pattern up here. I'll just zoom in. Uh, so it doesn't matter how messy things are, once the sort is finished, uh, nodes that are similar are grouped together. And I want them grouped in that particular way because I'm going to use another modern C++ miracle. I'm going to use the unique function. And the unique function looks through lists or containers for duplicate objects in series. And if it finds them, it removes them. So we can see here that group of Bs in the list will get found and then they'll get removed. Uh, and it works in pretty much the same way as the sort. In this case, um, I'm again passing in two references to the two tuples in the list. But instead of returning whether one is greater than or less than the other, this time I want to compare if they are the same. Because if they are the same and this returns true, then it removes it. And so it's very similar to the sort function, except this time I'm just checking the equality. You could argue I could check the individual parameters of the tuple as well. But I just like the symmetry that's going on here. And so admittedly, a completely overkill mechanism for removing duplicates, but nonetheless, I thought quite interesting. It allowed me to explore these functions in a little bit of detail. Now that I know I've got a unique list of newly discovered nodes, I'm going to clear the list of nodes that we've just been processing and replace that list with the newly discovered sorted node list. When there's nothing else to do, the algorithm is complete. And so yes, quite a wodge of code there, but most importantly, our flow field Z array has now been populated with distance values. So I'm going to draw those into our final map. In the routine where I'm drawing the cells, I'm going to add in an additional call to draw string. Uh, and I'm going to draw it in the same location as the top left of the cell. And all I'm doing here is converting the flow field Z value at that location to a string and coloring it in white. So now let's take a look at what's going to happen. Well, what we can see is our start location in green and our end location in red. And we see a bunch of numbers and we can see minus one uh, around the boundary. And that's because we set our boundary, don't forget, as being an obstacle. I could draw that in. It doesn't make any difference. But I'm not going to because I'll be clicking forever. I'll tell you what, I'll just do it anyway. Give me a minute. Perfect. But what we see is from our target location, that's marked with one. And the immediately adjacent cells, north, south, east and west, are marked with two. And then three, and then four, and then five. So emanating away from the target location, we see the distance is increasing. And because of the symmetry of our map, it's got no obstacles at the moment, we can see the furthest away locations is 18. And that implies it takes 18 steps in order to get from the target location to that location. And in fact, we can see that by following it just very simply. One, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty, four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. There we go, all the way to one of the corners. So let's start putting in some obstacles and seeing what happens. We're going to start randomly, let's put an obstacle in here. We see nothing changes really in the distance map, but the shortest path so far is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten from one side to the other. Now I've put an obstacle in the way. We can see that the distances are changing. And if we follow one of the paths, one, two, three, four, five, we see now we can go either way along the wall. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And this ability to follow the wall is because the wave has propagated and clung to the edge. Let's contain the target location. So we can see to actually get up here now to the top right, 
takes quite a number of steps, which is what you'd expect. It has to go basically all the way around the map. There's no solution now, so most of the map is set to zero. So let's just break a quick hole in there. With this little hole in the bottom, we can see the wave starts to propagate outwards. We're just basically following numbers that are the same. So the 11s curve out, then the 12s go out in a bigger radius around it, and the 13s start to form uh, what looks like a circle. Do you know what? This is very difficult to verbalise, so I'm going to hack in a way of displaying the wave. There we go. Perfect. Uh, so what I've done now is told it uh, to maintain a number, and if the number is equal to the distance value that we can see on the screen, to shade in that cell. So currently the wave is set at 1. If I set it to 2, set it to 3, 4, 5, 6. And so we can see from the target the wave has propagated outwards. So let's bring that back in. I'm going to have to draw all these walls again in now, aren't I? I'm going to try and replicate what we had before. I'm going to create a little room with a door. So we'll emanate a wave. We see the wave has passed out, but it's only got to the door uh, via one little cell that opens. But as it goes through the door, a new wave is created. And we can see now here at the bottom that the wave hugs the corner. Let's bring it back in. So let's try and make this quite complicated and see how it pans out. So each time there's an opening a new wave gets spawned and you can see the wave basically explores all of the available space. Until it reaches the target destination. It has to explore all available space, that's the only way this algorithm will know that it's found the complete path. We can visually see the path, but now we need to make the computer understand where the path is. So we'll have to program the algorithm to now extract the path from our height map. So this is the next phase. Create the path. And I'm going to represent my path again using some modern C. I'm going to use a standard list of pairs. Uh, obviously now the pair is just an x and y coordinate. I don't really care about the distance so much. And I'm going to straight away add to the path the starting location. I'm going to maintain three additional variables whilst I'm iterating through trying to find the path. Uh, first is location x and location y, which is the location I'm currently investigating to, to work out which direction I need to move for the path, and a boolean, which is no path, which means if there is no viable solution, the algorithm shuts down early. And so I want to assemble path segments until I either reach the end location, so my location x and location y is equal to the end location, or there is no viable path. So, for each neighbour, I'm going to generate, get this, another list of tuples. I'm going to look at my immediate north, south, east and west neighbours, and I'm going to then rank them, i.e. sort them, based upon uh, which one is the minimum. Because if you remember, we want to follow the path backwards, basically rolling downhill. We want to follow minimum heights. So that's the value we're going to be sorting on later on. And I'm going to assume to start with four-way connectivity. That's the simple one. So in a very similar manner to before, I'm doing a boundary check to make sure that I don't read memory I shouldn't. Uh, and I'm adding to the list of neighbours a new tuple, which is the location X and location Y, and the height at that location. So I've done that for north. I'll now do the same for east, south, and west. I'll now have a very small list of only valid neighbouring tuples. And I want to sort this list based on the height value. In fact, I want to sort it uh, from smallest to largest. Therefore, the item at the front of the list should be the path that I want to take. Indeed, if I have no neighbours that are valid at all, then I have no path and I want to exit prematurely. Otherwise, I'm going to isolate the location X and Y from the tuple and push that location into my path list. And that's it. So let's work on how we visualise the path. I can't draw the path as part of the cell drawing routine because the path itself is now just a list in its own right. So I'm going to create an auto for loop to iterate through the path and draw the locations. Now I want this to be a little bit aesthetically pleasing. Yes, I'm going to draw yellow circles where the coordinates are for each path element, uh, but I want to join them up with a line. And to do this, I need to firstly extract the first point uh, separately, which I do here. So I have a, an original X and an original Y value. Because the list of points is really a list of pairs this time and not a tuple, I can access the x-coordinate with the first parameter and the y-coordinate with the second parameter. 
I only want to do this for the very first point because I need a starting point for my line. The remaining points, uh, I can just use the point from the previous iteration of this loop. And so I'll use the draw line function to help me do just this. And it is going to be a little bit of a mouthful uh, for each coordinate, simply because I want to firstly scale. Don't forget, this will be in sort of node space. So this is a, a very small uh, coordinate system. I need to now scale it to the screen appropriately. Uh, so I'll take my X location, uh, which is the start of the line. I want to multiply it by cell size to get it up into screen space. But then I want to offset it by uh, half the cell size minus the border width because I want to draw it from the middle location of the cell. So that's for the X coordinate. I do exactly the same for the Y coordinate and I do exactly the same for the new coordinate except this time I'm using the current points first and second parameters. It's important that I remember to update my OX and OY values with those parameters for the next iteration. And finally on top of all that I am going to draw a big yellow circle to show which cell has been pathed. So let's take a look. Well, we can see the path has been discovered. This is what we saw at the start of the video, uh, except this time we've only got four-way connectivity. Now that might be desirable in certain applications where you want things to behave uh, in a very cellular manner. And I can also propagate the wave outwards to see the path that was chosen. Eight-way connectivity is quite a simple addition. We don't need to change the base algorithm that we created. All we need to do is add in an additional four checks in the path creation part of the algorithm. Effectively, we need to add northwest, southwest, northeast, and southeast. So I've done that as a one here. I'm going to just quickly remove the text being drawn, and we'll just see if that works. Very good. So it might not always be appropriate to have diagonals in your pathfinding, but you can have both uh, with a very simple change of the algorithm. Now, you may be wondering why some people call this potential fields. And indeed, why have I even called some of my variables field? The information that we currently have in our height map is enough to start giving us some gradients in the x and y directions. So I'm going to create two additional maps, flow field x and flow field y. Naturally, I want to create these to be the same size as the rest of the maps and initialize them to zero. By looking at the height values in the height map, we can extract information about local gradients. And so for a given cell, I can work out a resultant vector which represents the gradient at that location. Very simply, I just look at my neighbours, look at the direction north, south, east and west, look at the differences and sum them up. Well, it's not quite that simple because the minus one here will clearly bias the result of the calculation. So if we have a minus one, which is an obstacle, uh, I'm going to set that to be the same as the cell I'm currently testing. So in this eastern direction, there is no resultant change. Here we can see we've got a plus one in the x, uh, and on this side, it's a zero in the x. Up here we've got a plus one in the y, and down here we've got a plus one in the y. If we call this one left, and this one right, and this one up, and this one down, we can see that we get a dx value would be equal to r minus l, and a dy value would be equal to down minus up. So for this particular cell, we could say that dx is equal to minus one, and dy is equal to zero. We could go one step further and include eight-way connectivity as well, although I'm not going to in this example. You'd also have to include some root twos in there. But having a dx and a dy value is incredibly useful. So after we've created the path, I'm going to add in the optional step of creating the fields. And again, this will require me to iterate through our height map, uh, but I'm going to ignore the boundaries. I don't want to get into any boundary issues this time. I'm doing this in a slightly long-winded manner, but I'm going to create the individual uh, X and Y components and sum them up. Now, because I don't want to include minus ones, I'm using the ternary operator to make that check for me. So if it is less than or equal to zero, then the value that I'm adding is equal to my current location value. Once we've got that resultant vector, I can quickly work out the magnitude of it and populate my corresponding flow field X and flow field Y array locations with my gradient vector. I'm going to modify the cell drawing loops to include a way of visualizing this vector. And this is one of those times where I wish I'd copied some functionality over from the console game engine into the pixel game engine and I have neglected to do so. I will rectify that at some point. What I want to do is draw a little arrow to show the vector. 
and I only want to draw an arrow if indeed there is an arrow to draw. So I'm going to check that the height value is not an obstacle. Now my arrow is going to be a fairly standard arrow. It's going to consist of four points. Knowing that I've got a dx and a dy value, I can use the atan2 function to give me the angle, which we'll call theta. That's basically the angle that I've drawn in the dashed line here. I'm going to assume that my arrow fits in to a circle drawn by that dashed line there with radius r. Now that I know theta and r, I can use some simple modifications to cosine and sine functions to give me the coordinates of these four points of my arrow, between which I will draw the arrow lines. So I'll use the atan2f function to calculate the angle of the field at that particular location using the dx and dy components, and the radius is a function of the cell size and border width. I'll also need to calculate an offset, which is where I'm going to draw the arrow in the screen space. And the four arrow locations, uh, I'm just using cosine and sine and slight modifications to the angle to give me the offsets for the left and right hand side of the arrow and a slight modification of the radius. And then I'm just going to draw the three lines that make up the arrow between the relevant points. Let's take a look. So now what we can see with our arrows is something that indicates the field of flow towards the target location. So let me put in some obstacles. There we go, and we can see that the field changes as necessary. And what this reveals, if you haven't already picked up on it already, is that one pass of the algorithm essentially gives you a mapping from any location in the space to the target location. So it doesn't matter that my object is starting at this location, I could choose any location for it to start at. We can see that the flow field doesn't change at all. And so this becomes very useful uh, if you've got many, many agents that you want to get to a particular location. So imagine you've got a, a flock of sheep, for example. The sheep are scattered all over the map. They can all gradually flow to that particular target location uh, with one pass of the pathfinding algorithm. I wouldn't like to use this algorithm in a situation where I've got multiple agents trying to reach multiple destinations, simply because I'd have to create the entire wave-propagated field map for every single unit. I'd prefer in that case to use something like A star, simply because A star is a guided version of this algorithm. It uses heuristic, so we don't have to explore the entire map space in order to find the solution. And so as the designer, it's up to you to choose the appropriate pathfinding algorithm given your needs. In some cases, it may be even beneficial to merge the two together. And I might explore that in an upcoming video. So there you have it, pathfinding using wave propagation to generate a pathfinding potential field. If you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up and have a think about subscribing. If you wish to purchase me a cup of tea, you can do via my newly created Patreon account. Uh, the link is in the description below. But until then, take care.